um, doesn't help me. Um, did you already you already opened the meeting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So where you can do it, like invitations, you know, at the bottom, the bottom bar. I don't. There should. I don't see invitations. Uh, private participants with a plus or something. There should be a, a link to invite somebody or a panelist, maybe. I'm not sure. I'm not very familiar with webinars. Hello. About technology. Anyway, <laughs> let me start over. Um, I'm Elvia Thompson, president and co-founder of Annapolis Green. My co-founder is Lynn Forsman, who's um, joining us as well. So this is our third uh, webinar with Homestead Gardens this season um, to promote um, Here We Grow that Maggie just discussed, and also um, all the um, ways that Homestead Gardens can help gardeners um, find and plant and take care of native plants and uh, also vegetables. They have a really great program for native plants and of course, tons and tons of seedlings of vegetables and fruit available. So our first speaker today um, is Anna Cheney, and we are thrilled to have Anna with us. Um, she has been a, a fan and a supporter of Annapolis Green for a very long time. Those of you who um, have known us for a while remember our, our favorite um, green drinks venue, Homestead Gardens in March, always in March. Um, and Anna was the Anna's company was the caterer for that for many years. Um, so she knows just a little bit about food. Um, she's a, by training, she's a CPA, an entrepreneur, and she's certified in permaculture theory and design, as well as regenerative um, agriculture. And while she was a CPA before and a caterer, an entrepreneur. Now she is very proud to say that she's a farmer. Um, and when you ask her, what do you grow? She says, I grow soil. So she's going to explain that in a minute. Um, she's also an herbalist and, um, and, and a, a big, um, uh, wonderful asset to um, South County, South Anne Arundel County. Um, so she and her family have preserved over 1500 acres in agricultural and historic preservation and she lives on and takes care of a 160 acre permaculture farm called Honey's Harvest, which is a really fun place to go. They have a farmer's market on Sundays. And Anna is actually outside at Honey's Harvest um, showing us what it looks like. So Anna, you wanna um, start it off and tell us um, about all the wonderful reasons to grow flowers and vegetables together and how you do it and how what you do on the farm can um, translate to people's yards. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Olivia. That was very nice. Um, so I'm going to start with the soil part since you kind of introduced me that at first. And here is one of our um, hemp fields where we'll be growing hemp this year. So the reason we're going to talk about soil before we get into the, the food uh, edible landscape that I like to call it in our yards, which I do have here as well at our farmhouse. So I'm going to walk to the farmhouse while I'm talking after I explain the biology to show you what our yard looks like, because one of our goals, and especially my son's goal, as you can imagine why, was to fill as much of our yard as possible with food. So that tells you two things. One, you don't have to mow as much. And two, mm -hmm. you can walk outside your door and eat your breakfast, your lunch, and maybe even your dinner. So now to the soil. So soil is literally one of our biggest crops. And you can see that this type of agriculture is a little different than what we've seen in some other places um, in, in a lot of traditional agriculture where I grew up on a conventional ag farm. So I do understand that type of agriculture as well. In fact, I grew up selling corn and tomatoes on the side of the road um, on Route 2, which most people wouldn't stick their 14 and 13 year old kids out there today and do that. But at any rate, the soil is really, really, really important in growing, even in your yard. If you're growing food of any sort, I'm not sure if you can see that well, but 
quick biology lesson. Okay, you can see out here in the woods, and the woods doesn't get any kind of chemicals, but it grows so abundantly and so beautifully. And we have lots of food in these woods, and everywhere in Maryland has native food. So we harvest thousands of pawpaw every year from those woods back there. Black walnut, persimmon, wine berries, black raspberries, blackberries, all along the wood line here and in the woods. So what's going on in the soil out there to make that grow so well and abundantly without the fertilizers, without the, the, the herbicides, the pesticides? Why does that work? So there's something that's going on in the soil and that's where it all begins. So in the woods, the trees die, provide what we have here in this version, wood chips, right? So they're being broken down. And ultimately what you have is you have a synergistic relationship between the microbes, the microbial life in the soil and the tree or the plant itself. How does that work? So we all know that these plants do something called photosynthesis. These trees, these plants, the grass, everything, all the plants that we grow. So they're taking carbon dioxide, they're using everything, that, all the inputs that they need, and they're producing sugar for themselves to eat. However, just like you might do with your best friend, they share their sugar. So why would they share their sugar? Because they're feeding their friends, their best friends in the soil. To understand that when the tree performs photosynthesis, it creates sugars. 100% of those sugars are not by that tree. 50 and 50% 50 feed in the soil. Why? Because there are nutrients in the soil that the tree cannot access without his friends, his or her friends, <laughs> their friends. And so the friends are fungus, bacteria, nematodes, ciliates, all kinds of different little um, microbial life that is literally able to go into the crystalline substances in the soil, the silt, the clay, the rocks, and those little microscopic uh, organisms, they eat these mineral rich nutrients and they're so abundant in nutrients that the, the plant cannot access through their roots, but these little tiny things can. And it's so abundant that, you know, they can't use it all. So just like anything else that lives, it poops it out. And what comes out of those microbes is bioavailable food to the plant. That's how it works in nature. So the trees, the plants feed the soil. They're feeding the microbial life in the soil. The microbial life in the soil goes down into the earth and it eats the nutrients out of the, the clay and all the things that the plant cannot access. And then what comes out is the food of the plant. So what we do is we spend a lot of time growing that soil, that kind of rich soil that you saw. And what you want for most of the plants that we grow to eat is a balance between bacteria and the fungi to flourish in that soil. So it's really important to have nitrogen and carbon. And this is all sounding kind of biological and like chemistry, but it's so easy. And if you come out to one of our tours on Sundays, you can learn hands-on. So behind me here is a, a garden where it's, it's, in my opinion, it's pretty, and it's also abundant in food and medicine. So what you're looking at right now is about 10 species of edible plants. Um, there's one non-edible over here, the iris is not edible. Um, but we have milk thistle, fennel, chamomile, um, persimmon, elderberry, autumn olive or autumn berry, june berry. Uh, let's see here. We have gumi berry and goji berry and pawpaw. So all of that is right in here. Now, this is sort of like, um, I don't know, maybe some people might think of it as a messy garden, but then we also have actually right over here. What I find is really important is as these plants grow together, they're literally feeding the, the soil, the microbes in the soil for each other. And so the soil is really abundant with life. So having all of these things kind of together is a permaculture concept and it really works well to create healthy nutrient dense plants, which then produce healthy nutrient dense fruits, nuts, berries, greens, whatever you're growing. 
So that's really ultimately what you want. This is the way it was meant to be by nature. And so what we know, uh, Rodale Institute is a great place to go look at this research. Um, they test the um, production that's grown in living soil, not just organic, but living soil. And the, the proof is there in the science that these, these types of, this type of growth produces things that we're, we were meant to consume. These are the types of fruits and vegetables and nuts and berries that will give us the nutrients that we need to thrive. So we feel better when we eat out of these types of gardens. And I just wanted to show you that here, we just cut this today, this is comfrey. This is a fantastic companion plant. I'm gonna see, here's one over here where the plant is still, um, still here. And this is a bioaccumulator. So this plant is growing next to this jujube tree right here. And this is comfrey. And while comfrey is a, um, an herbal medicinal, it's highly recommended for topical use only at this time, unless you're a very experienced herbalist. And um, this plant just growing next to this jujube is feeding it um, nutrients. And the cool thing about these comfreys, which I would highly recommend as a companion plant for any garden, is that they, you can cut them and they continue to grow throughout the season. So you're going to get more comfrey throughout the season, even if you cut them. And you can dig up their tubers mid-season anytime you want, cut the tuber and put it in five different locations and you'll get five different comfrey plants in the same year. So what we did today is we cut them and we put them in a, a tub to make sun tea. And the sun tea will now be the fertilizer for these plants. So I'll show you that real quick. And um, Anna, can I ask a question while you're okay. walking over there? Sure. So isn't comfrey something that you use like for scratches or, or bruises or things like that? I mean, I know it has medicinal qualities of some kind. It's, um, yeah, you can make a tea or even a, like a, um, like you can grind it up and then brew it and you'll extract all the good medicinal qualities out of it. And you can put comfrey in, almost like a compress. You can use it like on a broken bone and it, it actually does work. My son unfortunately had to use it, but it was amazing. So here is the tea that we're brewing. Um, now this is I don't We're having trouble hearing you, Anna. We did Anna, Anna, your uh, internet connection is cutting out. So um, maybe you could repeat what you said in the past minute or, or so. We observe things in nature. For example, the wild persimmon, the black walnut and the pawpaw, they live together really well. However, a lot of things don't like to live around black walnut. So it's almost like you can try it out in your garden and then see what things seem to like each other and which ones, which ones don't. Um, there's always the, the three sisters that a lot of people like to talk about, um, the corn, the bean, and the squash. And that's certainly a tried and true um, companion. However, a lot of um, herbs, rosemary, thyme, tulsi, um, cilantro, these are all great companion plants for just about any type of gardening that you're going to do. So I would highly recommend considering the ones that you enjoy things from helping just feed the soil and feeding each other, literally feeding, you know, the other plants. Now in the history of agriculture, it's kind of funny because I think that some of these companion plantings were not necessarily because people thought that it was a cool thing to do. It's because it was a necessity. So they were may be limited in the area and the resources that they had to, to plant their gardens. So they really wanted to figure out ways to utilize the space to the best of their ability. Um, you know, even if you imagine, you know, native peoples, tribes and things like that, um, they may, you know, not have the resources to farm, you know, 200 acres of property or something. So, when they did these things, I'm pretty sure they observed nature. 
character and then they did what they needed to do. So when you think about the three sisters, you think about, you know, the squash and the, the squash being on the low, you know, the lower ground cover sort of thing. And then you think of the, the beans growing up the stalk of the corn and then the corn. And if you think about that, that's just a really smart use of space. And they knew that those three grew well together from trial and error. So don't be afraid to be creative and try different things and, and talk to the, the uh, knowledgeable folks at Homestead Gardens and wherever you like to go. And we also like to um, host workshops here at the farm. And the, at the farm tours, we're often offering some of our natives here that you can purchase while you're here at the farm, at the farm market. And we can, we can guide you on what we have found works well also. So if, if you have other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I would like to make it over to the other side so you can see a garden that you might be willing to put in your front yard and be very proud of. Um, my absolute favorite thing to do is to walk out my door and enjoy whatever's growing for three seasons a year and sometimes four seasons, depending on our timing. It was two winters ago. I planted, I think I planted kale at the exact right time in the fall and I had kale through the entire winter so it just the other thing about growing in living soil and there's a difference between living soil and organic soil living soil means you you know that the things are alive in there and you're not even necessarily using organic um, additives if they have some sort of a chemical makeup in them or even an imbalance um, so we have to we at honey's harvest farm you know, choose to not do that and use those types of things because we want our soil to be alive and we want it to be so safe, like so safe that you can, you literally could eat a teaspoonful of the soil. So the thing about eating right out of your garden when you grow that way is you're actually feeding the microbes into your gut that your gut needs to balance with the good bacteria. So this is the way we were kind of meant to be because that's the way it was before all of the things that we Anna you you froze up maybe you could say this is the way this is the way that it was meant to be before and then you froze up after that so can you repeat that Oh, sure. So this is the way it was meant to be before we had all the things and the access to the industrialized food systems and even that type of agriculture that we have today. So pardon the shooting in the background. My son is um, practicing, I think. So timing might be a little, a little off. Don't mind. Everything's safe and fine. <laughs> there we go. Um, so, so what happens is in the summertime, especially when we get a lot of fruits, we all, then my family, we can, we feel better in our guts. We can tell our digestion is so smooth and seamless because we make a point to eat directly out of the garden, not to wash the fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, you might kind of shake off the big stuff because you don't want to eat like a chunk of dirt or something, soil, but um, it, it, it really works. So here, I just want to point out, this is part of our food forest garden. Um, this is a program we're in with the state of Maryland and we're growing native fruits and nuts. Some of these are like wild, like these um, tulip poplars here are not fruits or nuts for us, although they are really good for the bees. Um, this is a hazelnut and this, these produced for the first year last year in pretty good abundance. So this fall, if you want to come out and harvest your own hazelnuts, they're amazing. I never knew that they were native to Maryland until about seven years ago when we started this program. So there will be plenty of food here. We have 14,000 trees planted now and we're going for another year yet. So we'll have even more. Um, does anybody have any questions while I make my way through the woods here and then over to the, the edible lawn for you to see? Uh, so Anna, I have a question um, because of how your internet's going in and out. So did you say that any, I believe what you said was that pretty much any herb that you like is a good companion for, um, for it, flowers, uh, vegetables, whatever. Is that what you said? Yeah, I've not found an herb that has been detrimental to anything that I've grown. And I think we've grown over a hundred species here since about 2015. 
with all kinds of different herbs and companions. So not once have I found anything that is detrimental to the other, except you might want to look up if you're growing black walnuts, the juggling in the black walnut is not conducive to some plants. But um, that's not something that a lot of people grow. It's a very long, you know, it takes a long time to grow a black walnut tree and actually have it produce. So and I know you grow sweet potatoes because you have a sweet potato festival, which which I hope you'll talk about because that's so much fun. But do you also grow potatoes? Uh, yes. In fact, I would just pass some in the gardens where I was. Oh, that's getting really loud. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I really want you to see this garden. I'll make it here. Um, so, yes, we do. Now, I will say that we've had a little bit of an incident. Are you still there? Yes. Okay. So, unfortunately, at Honey's Harvest Farm, we had a very tragic incident where an outside company came onto our property and by mistake um, treated our areas, our organic and our regenerative ag, two and a half acres of our property with toxic chemicals. Oh no. Yeah, I'm walking up the hill, sorry. <laughs> so, so unfortunately that's the area where we had the sweet potato fest and planted all those beautiful sweet potatoes. We had about, I think 2000 pounds last year. And because of the way we grow in the living soil, we get way more production out of each plant. That's another thing about growing this way. You spend a lot less money and a lot less labor once you have your gardens established because we don't buy chemicals. We don't have to pay or do it ourselves to spread those chemicals. So, whoo, <laughs> I gotta walk that hill more often. Um, so, so unfortunately, we may not be having our sweet potato fest this year but believe me, we will be having it next year. So yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's, um, we still will grow sweet potatoes in a different area. So we will have them at our market, but I don't know that we'll be able to have them at a festival this year. Well, so that was a good segue. Can you tell us about the market then? Sure. Um, so the Sunday market is year round and we are so blessed to have co a cooperative event where six founding farmers and artisans come every Sunday year round to offer their products to the public. And we also offer a farm tour every Sunday um, until it gets really hot. It will be at one o'clock and then we'll switch over to 10 a.m. for the tour. And we have everything from produce, honey, elderberry syrup, herbal teas, um, flowers, fresh cut flowers, We'll have uh, meats from a different farm. Uh, they'll have poultry. They'll have eggs and uh, oysters, pork products. oysters, oysters, oysters and fish, even uh, scallops and uh, other fish from the Outer Banks. That's the one that comes the farthest. And um, it's a really fun time. It's 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. every Sunday. And we also have the first Sunday market, which is a lot bigger. So that one we have about 15 to 20 different vendors and that includes some local food vendors like rutabaga and sometimes Harrington on the Bay can make it. So I have finally made it to our house gardens. So here are, when you walk into the house, this is what you walk through. It's a parking lot. Yeah, unfor first. unfortunately you're still frozen. Oh no. <laughs> All right, so I'll stand still for a minute. Is it coming back in? No, maybe get closer to the, there you are. Great, go ahead. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna just turn the camera so you can see. These are our gardens that we put in a couple of years ago, right, literally right outside of our door, the one that we use so often. So what I learned in permaculture, probably the number one kind of rule or theory is that there are zones in permaculture, zone one, two, three, four. And four would be one that you kind of never go to. So like back in the woods somewhere where you never make it out there um, and all the way back to one where that's where you, your path is every day. So what I learned was when you put a garden in zone one, you're gonna work that garden and you're gonna enjoy that garden a lot more than if it's out there in zone three, which has to take you know, 10 minutes just to get to it. And then you're like, oh, I got so many things to do. I'm just gonna go in the house and I'll get out there before the sun goes down. And then you never make it out. And it's kind of like, and then you look out there a few weeks later and it's full of weeds. 
So I highly recommend considering the concept of permaculture in bringing your garden to your primary premium space. Now, we're not as particular about landscaping, but you can make gorgeous, I mean gorgeous edible landscaping. And I'm gonna show you before the end of this, when somebody else is talking, I'm gonna grab one, a copy of a book written by an author who lives in Frederick, Maryland. It's called Edible Landscapes or Edible Landscaping. And it's, he designs these edible landscapes for people and they are gorgeous and delicious. So here's our entryway to our house. Still and frozen, so, Anna, still frozen, unfortunately. Just keep with your great descriptions, Anna. <laughs> okay, okay, so you can't see anything, you can't see the gardens. No gardens. No. No gardens. Oh my gosh, that whole walk over here. Um, so, well, with if you could see them, I wish that I could connect to maybe Wi-Fi, but of course my phone doesn't even do that. Um, so what we have here, if you can, maybe it'll come in in a second here. Uh, these are some radishes that are right here in the edible landscaping right outside the door right next to strawberries, which are right next to the spinach, which is right next to the arugula, Yay. right next to the kale. And then you can see some random hemp plants in here that are gonna have to go. Um, <laughs> we have a license to grow hemp with the state of Maryland and Morgan State University. But um, those were, um, they, they kind of just came back up the, this year. So the, those will not be harvested for our production other than for tea, but these well, are, white flowers what are those so actually this is a this is a radish that's meant to be planted in the fall and we tried it out in the spring but it actually got kind of warm there in the early spring so they didn't work out so they're flowering now we're going to let them flower and go to seed so you can see some of the seeds um, seed balls here at the top of the bulbs and we will collect the seeds and then we'll plant them in the fall again and see if we can get so they didn't actually produce full radishes but they are pretty and um I can pull one up so you can see they're just not they just didn't um, they didn't fill out because they're a fall radish um, but here we have this beautiful lettuce which has been absolutely delicious this will be at our market also on Sunday and then here we have arugula that we enjoyed all spring and now it's bolting um, and here we have chamomile which my daughter loves making tea with and it will go into some of our production tea as well and the beets are coming along nicely over here and these are sun roots, which will be absolutely gorgeous in a few months. They'll have beautiful uh, yellow flowers. Our fig trees are here right outside of our house. And that's great to be able to walk out. We actually can look right out of our kitchen windows and see when the figs are ripe and head right over to the fig trees and enjoy them. And here, like I was saying before, are radishes. And I've been eating these right out of the garden on a regular basis. The strawberries are phenomenal. Let's see, here's some. And moving along down a little bit further away from the house, we have a big blackberry patch. That's what you're looking at here. There are blackberries and raspberries and aronia berries. You can see some of the strawberries here. So you can have, you know, gardens that are even, I mean, much more beautiful than this. Uh, we are very functional here. So we do enjoy the beauty, but we also really like the production and, um, and the convenience of being able to walk outside the door and down the path in the blackberry patch and just you can hide back here under the oak tree and just sit and eat your blackberries uh, right outside your kitchen door and you'll probably be able to hide from everyone else if you need a little respite so no one will see you down here in this little garden um, and then another little fig tree a little little surprise here so and then below this we have our elderberries which are more for production so the further we get away from the house the less close are the things that we actually want to eat you know, on a regular basis on, on the day to day. Can you see all that? Yes. Okay, good. So, and then going further away, this is probably more like zone two in permaculture. We have more of what I do like to call production strawberries. So we'll be harvesting these and offering these at market, but I was out here at lunchtime today um, enjoying these strawberries because they are absolutely delicious. So again, <laughs> edible landscaping is what I highly recommend to anyone who enjoys food. You want to know where your food came from. You want to know that it's nutritious and hopefully grown in living soil if you can do that. 
And um, like I said, you can hire and work with people or read Michael Jez's book and know how to make it even more beautiful. There it is, edible landscaping, perfect. It's not, it's not, um, it's not focusing, in. yeah. No. Well, anyway, that's what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> edible landscaping with, with a permaculture twist and the tagline is how to have your yard and eat it too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> One of my favorites. It's great. And it's so wonderful to literally walk outside. And if you actually like to get into the soil a little bit more, you can get um, wine cap mushroom mycelium and or a mushroom block, and you can put it in your gardens, your wood chips, because if you cut, if you top your gardens with wood chips, you're going to keep the moisture in, you're going to encourage like during a drought like now, you're going to encourage um, mycelium growth, and then you're going to be able to harvest and eat the wine caps. So that's how it works in nature. It can provide you with pretty much all that you need. Um, in addition to the fact that the wood chips during a flood will keep your garden from flooding away, they hold it intact. So they're like a drought um, remediator and they are also a flood remediator. So wood chips, not too many, but, and also not colored or treated with anything just natural wood chips free from the side of the road guys that are cutting the trees down. It's a fantastic way to build your soil. So thank you so much. If there are any other questions, please do let me know. I hope you can hear me and um, I'll make my way back to the other side so that um, hopefully it'll be more stable and I can listen to the, the rest of the presentation. Do any of the folks um, uh, listening have questions? If you do, the way this is set up, we can't really hear you, but if you type in your question to the chat, we'll pass it on to Anna. Um, so Maggie, I'm thinking that um, maybe we should roll the, the video on, um, on Here We Grow. Sure, we can do that. We also have one on Annapolis Green, if you'd like to roll that too. You wanna start sure. with the Here We Grow one? Either way, either way. Okay, well, let's start with the one that we have for Annapolis Green. This is just a little introduction from uh, Lynn and Elvia about Annapolis Green. So give me just one moment here. And then we'll, uh, after we do that, we'll talk about um, some of the, the pollinator plants that are available at Homestead. I'm Elvia Thompson. I'm Lynn Forsman. Well, it was about 14 years ago when Annapolis Green got started. And our main goal is to energize what's going on in the environmental community and bring it to businesses, individuals, the government folks to really try and make it easy, accessible. We provide resources, we offer programming. Donate, volunteer with us, come to an event. If there's an environmental topic that interests you, we've probably done some research on it. So have a look online at annapolisgreen.com. Let's all get together for the greener good. Yay. <laughs> a little so, bit so while Maggie uh, keys, uh, cues up the, the next video, um, we no longer, our office is no longer in there where you just saw us in the video, but we are still maintaining that garden. So it's a little urban farm um, on State Circle and Maryland Avenue. And we're doing very much what Anna's doing, on, but on a tiny scale. Um, we're planting um, vegetables and, um, and flowers all together. We don't use any synthetic fertilizers, no pesticides, you know, it's, and it's lovely. It's just filling in now. We are so thankful to the new owner of our building to allow us to come back in and take care of the garden for the next six months. So we can message and showcase what we're doing as we call it our demonstration garden for Here We Grow. I was over there um, the other day watering. Yes, we have to do that again now. Um, and oh my goodness, you should see what's coming up. The flowers are, are gaining strength, but the vegetables are right there neck and neck. Exactly we want, what we want to have happen. Did you see how pretty the beets were in the boat, Lynn, when yes. you were there? Aren't those leaves yes. beautiful? Yeah. Yeah, and when Anna was talking about letting the the radishes go to seed, so we let we let some onions go to seed, and my gosh, the flowers were just beautiful. Right. And we started with one tomato plant, and when I was going at it yesterday, I found all these little hitchhiker plants. They're sprouting up. I think I found an additional five little tomato plants out there. 
Oh, from all those seeds that we must have dropped when we <laughs> yeah, were. some very funny yeah. photos of us trying to take down. <laughs> I love it. Well, we've got a really great little video too to share about Here We Grow. So hang tight and I'll get that going for us. Grow something. That's Annapolis Green's message for the spring. Join our Here We Grow program to get closer to nature, grow beautiful, native, ornamental plants, and some of your own food right in your yard. Here We Grow is a modern take on the World War II Victory Garden. We are enlisting home gardeners to form a community in our area to share information, support each other, and garden a little differently. Don't push your veggies into the backyard. Put them right out in front with your native flowers. Be proud of growing food and providing pollinator habitat. Your neighbors will be amazed at your harvest and the planet will be happy too. Whether you have acres or just a few pots in the balcony, you can grow flowers and food for a beautiful and delicious garden. For more information, see the Here We Grow page on annapolisgreen.com. Thank you, Maggie. Okay. So, I, so I don't see any questions from um, the folks who are on. Um, okay, so um, unfortunately, Heather Wheatley from um, Homestead Gardens was not able to join us today. Um, well, actually, she could have joined us, but her Wi-Fi went down, so, so she couldn't join us. Mm -hmm. But um, I wanted to tell you about some of the, um, the things that, are, that um, are available if you're talking, if you're thinking of putting in natives and particularly pollinator-friendly plants into your garden. Um, Homestead has something called the Pollinator Cafe. So they've put all of the plants that, that, are, um, that attract pollinators together on their lot there. Um, and some of them are, um, well, let's see. So they, they have trees, they have tree, willow trees, um, oak trees and redbud um, available. Um, some of the trees are bigger than others. Oak trees of course are, are wonderful because nothing, um, is as much of a home for as many different types of uh, critters as oak trees. Oak trees support more insects and birds and other, other um, living things than any other single type of tree. They also have um, Monarda um, and uh, Coreopsis and Salvia um, in, in big quantities. So those are definitely available there. And they, um, and in their emails, um, Homestead um, highlights different um, pollinator plants each time. And this time they've um, highlighted Echinacea, um, also known as cornflower, which it looks like a pink or sometimes orange um, black-eyed Susan. Um, and it's an important source of nectar for butterflies and, and birds like goldfinches. So um, that's a good one to put in the yard. And also one called Achillea, which you may know better as yarrow. Um, and that has um, beautiful yellow uh, sort of balls of flowers. Um, and it's, it's uh, Homestead uses it a lot in containers because their theory is the, the, uh, the thriller, which is the cool looking plant, the filler, the filler in, and then the spiller that spills over the sides. So yarrow is the filler in a lot of their pots. And also the good thing about yarrow is it's um, uh, drought resistant and it grows in soil that isn't so good and the deer don't like it. So um, anyway, there's a lot of information available from the nursery. I don't know if you wanna add anything to that, Anna. Um, you know, certainly we'd like to hear from you. Absolutely, I think it's actually almost imperative to have a nutrient dense vegetable annual to have the, the flowers because we need the pollinators and we need the pollinators for most of the flowering annuals as well. So when we have the flowers that encourage the health of our pollinators, then the pollinators can survive the different seasons because oftentimes if everything is blooming at the same time, then our pollinators don't have food. So they're gonna migrate somewhere else to get their food. And you may not have them when you really want them or need them. And we know that it's imperative to have uh, a healthy pollinator uh, ecosystem for all of the, the life on the planet. So I am a big proponent of making sure you have, to the best of your ability, something flowering as long as you can through our growing season in Maryland. So we're fortunate to have um, in our food forest garden, the opportunity to choose the trees 
And so the tulip poplars and the uh, black locust provide early food for the, the bees, that the honeybees. And so here we have 15 hives on the farm. And I know there are many hives in the area now. So the more we grow these types of things, the better our, all of our collective bees are going to do. And then of course, we're going to have the honey. So I think that um, that's a fantastic message to uh, share. And you know, I'm sure a lot of people are already doing that. Um, but one more flower is not a waste of space. <laughs> okay. Sylvia, a quick question. When you mentioned Monarda, because I'm always trying to connect the common name with the more scientific name, is that the bee bomb? I don't think so. Oh, it Anna, is. Anna, Anna says Anna's it is. Nodding. Yeah. I, I, am, so. I am no good with those scientific and names. We have so much of that in our garden. And once it fires up, mm -hmm. glorious. And so much so that in the past, when they have paint Annapolis taking place with the plein air artists in, um, there was an amazing painting they did of our bee bomb in bloom with some flocks by it that was uh, sold for quite a bit of money down the street in the gallery. <laughs> well, you know, um, oh, Anna's saying something. What, you're, you're on mute, Anna. Cool thing about bee bomb or Monarda is it is edible, the flower, and it tastes really good. It's like worth trying. So, you know, as long as you're growing it without chemicals, and I know you are, um, you can eat that and it tastes really good. You can also make a tea out of it. It's kind of how, a fun little treat. How would you eat it? Put it in salad or what? Yeah, you could definitely put it in salad. And like, you know, my style is right off the plant. So I like <laughs> to just go out and have a little nibble. <laughs> okay. Well, I know that a lot of people on this call are um, big uh, pet lovers. So Lynn has a little announcement. A few years back, um, I think you guys might have met my, my golden retriever. Her name is Addie from the Adirondacks, and she was our office mascot. But we figured we needed somewhat of a spokesperson for our Here We Grow, and what better than a spokes pup? So we anointed her our, goal, our garden goldie. <laughs> and um, she had this little collar that had flowers on it, leather flowers on it. Um, but it wasn't a real collar and she kept losing the flowers and always got so many compliments. So we started thinking once we came up with the beautiful and delicious name, encouraging planting the veggies in with the flowers, we thought, you know, what better spokesperson than our dogs, our pets. So we found an amazing local artist, Chrissy Mayer, um, with Great Mayor Mercantile. And she has developed a one of a kind leather collar with flowers on it, five different sizes. Um, and for the veggie, because believe it or not, when you're making these collars and cutting out leather, you know, there's no really spot to put in a veggie, like, you know, the center of a flower. So the collar itself is flowers, but we're gonna have a veggie charm, stressing the importance of having that vegetable in with those flowers. We also have a wonderful little pouch she's making us that has veggies on it that holds um, your, your doggy bags as well as treats. So this is all gonna be through her site on Etsy and we're kind of making the announcement tonight. So it's the Annapolis Green Here We Grow beautiful and delicious collar for your pets. So I hope you'll take advantage of it and look it up and um, and of course the proceeds 100% she's gonna be bringing back to Annapolis Green for our Here We Grow program. The address is in the chat, but we'll also put that out in our next email blast. I have a picture I'd like to share too so you can kind of get an idea of what everything looks like. There we go. Can everybody see? And that's, that's the, little, the little companion treat bag that's underway. And Addie's debuting the collar now. She just, we just got it, but we have to wait for the charm. <laughs> Beautiful. And delicious. That's right. <laughs> okay. okay, Maggie. So um, we have a, uh, a, a gift basket to give away. So. We do, um, and in addition to the beautiful gift basket that Homestead Gardens is donating um, tonight, there's gonna be a $50 gift card with that as well. And to win that, you just have to get the trivia question correct. Anna, would you like to ask it? I'll also drop it in the chat so everybody can read it, but if you'd like to ask your question, 
Go for it. Sure. So what plant did both Thomas Jefferson and George Washington claim to be an imperative crop for Americans, for the American farmer? Okay, we have one answer so far. That's corn. Come on, the rest of you. <laughs> what you got? Keep <laughs> guessing. It's not corn. <laughs> 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 it's, it's not it's not darn um, it's not it's not apples no Rita sorry okay <laughs> it's not great keep going guys it was uh, can, can we give any hints sure well Anna's been talking about it guys yep Anna mentioned it yay ah uh, Kara Kara congratulations Kara <laughs> And the right answer is hemp. Good job. <laughs> so Kara, you can pick up your gift basket and gift certificate at Homestead Gardens Davidsonville location. Just let them know at the front desk and they'll have that for you. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, well, unless um, folks have any other questions, I think we're, we can wrap it up, um, but please visit Honey's Harvest. A good time would be this Sunday. It's gonna be a nice day. And uh, you'll just be amazed at how beautiful it is. And uh, just to kind of entice you a little more, um, it's probably, we probably shouldn't announce this, but what the heck. So we're trying to put together a uh, harvest dinner at Honey's Harvest this fall, right when everything's in, in, in full fruit, um, you know, a wonderful group dinner um, for all of us. So stay tuned for that. Any, yeah. any party words, Anna? Sure. Um, yeah, everyone's welcome every Sunday and soon we'll be open as a Memorial Day weekend on Saturdays too. So we'll have Saturdays on the farm. And this coming Saturday, we happen to have an herbal tea workshop at 10 a.m. Tickets are available. And on Sunday, uh, every Sunday, we offer the farm tour and we also have private picnic areas that you can reserve and bring your own picnic. You can bring whatever you want and they're very spacious and um, we have some of those left for Sunday as well. So we'll love, we would love to see you out here. And if you are on this call and you come this Sunday, we can offer you 10% off of an edible landscaping book written by Michael Judd. So just mention the Here We Get Grow program and we'll make sure you get your discount. Thank you, Anna, that sounds awesome. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for attending. Um, we will um, get the recording and make it available um, as soon as, we can. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everyone. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Bye.